Complex. Good evening, everybody. This is the journey. College of Complexes, and we have some very complex uh, matters to discuss. And uh, we have our own complexes that we bring to them. Uh, Do you want to go Yes. No, no. Uh, tonight we have with us Lee D. Young Yuan, uh, who is uh, from. Taiwan originally. Yes. Uh, his family may have been from other parts of China, but parents are from China. So without further ado, then I will introduce our speaker and go collect what there is to collect. Li Heng Yuan. Yay! Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I think this is the second time I present uh, something in the uh, College of Complex. And uh, I really like uh, everybody has different ideas, every has their own ideas, and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, think through lots of thinking. This is the playground of uh, uh, thinking people. So last time I talked about uh, democracy a little bit, and uh, I don't know how many people were here last time. That's two years ago, okay, September, so more than two years ago. Uh, today I would like to talk about uh, our future of the democracy, and uh, It might not be on. Okay. Okay. Basically, the last time I mentioned this, the democracy has been very successful for the last uh, 238 years. That's the history of this country. And uh, this country is uh, the first democratic country. And uh, it's not only in this country, this country is certainly very successful, it's the number one in the world, but also around the world, um, lots of countries are also democratic uh, after this country is established. So I think it's a very successful story, especially after the Cold War. Before the, or during the Cold War, uh, many people still thinking, yeah, democratic world against the communist world. They, they were not sure which one will win the, the, the Cold War. Uh, so they are not 100% behind the democratic country. But uh, after the Cold War, it's obvious uh, the communist country collapsed and the democratic uh, system is uh, uh, the only uh, system in the world to be successful. So, democratic system is good. Look at some graphs uh, from Wiki Wikipedia. Uh, the number of democratic uh, nations scored eight or higher, that's uh, highly democratic, just not just so-so uh, democratic, it's highly democratic so uh, countries. Uh, the number from zero to more than 60 in last uh, uh, 200 years. So uh, basically, it's a, it's a dram dramatic increase uh, in the recent uh, probably 50 years, and it shows the, the trend of the whole world is moving this way. And also, if you count uh, all the countries that has election, then there are almost two-thirds of the country in the world has election. And uh, so it's a, a major success. And uh, another successful uh, point is uh, if you look at the, before this uh, democratic uh, movement, almost all the world for thousands of years uh, it's a monarchy system you have kings and queens and the royal families 
And uh, now they are almost gone. There are a few countries still there, but uh, they are either no power or uh, the power is uh, limited. So uh, basically, monarchy system is, uh, is uh, on the way out. This is more significant than this uh, graph. So, however, we just had an election uh, not long ago, uh, November 4th, and uh, I don't know whether you are all satisfied with our election. We cast the vote, and uh, you think that uh, the government will do their business, uh, follow our, uh, uh, follow their promises uh, to us? Uh, probably not. <laughs> and uh, also this happens on all different level of government, uh, no matter it's in D.C., in Springfield, in City Hall. People know uh, there are lots of things uh, going wrong there. For today's talk, I'll emphasize on the legislative branch uh, part, because I think this is the part that we can make a more most improvement and uh, needs to be, moved, uh, uh, to be improved because uh, if you just look at the uh, people's confidence on the Congress, uh, it's really, really low. The first complaint is uh, partisan. Just think about uh, before you, uh, before the election, you try to find a good candidate and uh, the, your, your choice is limited, either left or right, and uh, nothing in the middle, nothing uh, specifically uh, have a different opinion, or if they have some not right or not left, you have Green Party, uh, but they are not significant, at least so far. So you don't have much choice. For example, if I'm a religious person, I'm pro-life, so maybe pro-Republican, but I'm also willing to uh, take care of uh, the 99% of the mass um, population. That's more pro-Democrat. So I don't have a choice there. Or if I'm an uh, environmentalist, uh, and uh, maybe pro-democratic, uh, uh, but I'm also a free market uh, a person promoting uh, economic, and uh, there's no good choice for me. So the first thing is uh, you go to the election season, you don't see a good choice. And uh, then uh, the winner takes all. So after the election, if your preferred candidate uh, lost uh, the, the election, then you have no voice for the four year, for the next four years or two years or six years. So basically you are a loser also. And uh, I don't think it's fair, but the uh, current system is like that. If you, your candidate, your preferred candidate lost the election, you are out of the picture. You have no voice anymore. If uh, for some reason you select a good candidate and uh, he won the election, that's great. Go to D.C. or Springfield and uh, say, yay, starting to do, to do the, the, their, their duties, uh, their work. But uh, then they found out they, they are bound by party lines, uh, they have to pa follow the party procedures, and uh, they, they also surrounded by uh, lobbyists, and uh, their thoughts probably uh, changed quickly. So what's left for the voter? Uh, practically nothing. You don't have a good candidate to start with. Even if you're lucky, you find a good candidate, it can last the election and then shut down your voice. Or even you win the election and uh, your voice may not carry through the, uh, the term. Unless you become a lobbyist yourself, then probably they will listen to you. So, uh, 
you probably can have uh, more and more complaints. Uh, uh, it's just a uh, uh, big mess. So what's wrong? What's happening? We have such a wonderful uh, democracy for the last 200 plus years, and uh, now uh, almost nobody is satisfied uh, on the current situation. Uh, if we want to, I try to answer this question through, uh, let's think about why democracy was successful in the first place. Uh, that's the part, uh, the major part of uh, I said in my first talk uh, two years ago. Uh, the answer is, uh, I think, is communication. Communication technology changes, and uh, and especially after we have the newspaper available, the newspaper can send the, the information to general public. Okay, so. Before that, the general public basically knows nothing, knows nothing official, knows nothing uh, solid or confirmed. Uh, or if they learn something, probably already a few years uh, afterwards, so it's not relevant anymore. So the newspaper really changed the uh, things. It provides the uh, general public all the issues and the things happening around the uh, around the uh, in a timely fashion, and then you have telephone, telegraph, so those can do the long distance uh, communication. So newspaper becomes uh, not only give you local news in a timely manner, it also give you nationwide news uh, or even world news uh, in a timely manner. So uh, people, once they know the issues, they know what's going on, people have a desire to say this is good or bad. If it's bad, people have a desire to change it. And then in the early 1900, uh, we have radios and the TV come up. They gave much more power to the, this mass media uh, tool. So everybody, if you don't, don't even have to read, if you don't know how to read, you can still listen to the radio and uh, watch TV to get all the information you need. And uh, this is a, a, com a kind of communication technology. It's one to many. So still, uh, give the general public lots of information by few people, because we have only a few newspaper, a few uh, radio stations, and a few TV stations. But uh, for those uh, amount of information, and uh, we, we do have a, a good drive, or the public knows the issue, and they want to change the government. And this is basically the drive for the democracy. Now, since the uh, 1970s, the internet, it's a many-to-many -many, uh, communication tool. So almost everybody can send out messages to all the people. So you can send an email to hundreds or thousands of people without much problem. You can establish a website. Uh, then everybody can read it, can, can access that. The Google comes up, so through the search engine, if some people have the same interest as you are, and they, through the Google search, they will find your website and then read your opinions. So you don't even have to advertise your work, your thoughts, and it will be there. And uh, Wikipedia is another organized uh, information. So if you want to, it's a review. The, uh, so it's a not quite not biased uh, information. So if you want to get uh, some quick understanding uh, about one thing, if it's in Wikipedia, it's a, a very good place to start with. Do you want any details? And of course, YouTube. In, 
2005, and uh, uh, you can know all the things in a relaxed manner. You don't have to read uh, seriously. You can just watch and listen. That's all you. So basically, this is uh, information and the democracy relationship. If there's no information provided to the general public, there's no complaints because nothing to complain. They don't know anything. They cannot complain. Uh, they may not feel good, but uh, they couldn't do anything. So at that time, monarchy is fine. Uh, everything controlled by the king. Only king knows what's going on. Other people just uh, uh, shut up. Uh, then we have uh, some information with newspaper, radio, and TV. We have uh, people has some dissatisfaction, and uh, that's the driving force for democracy. People want to have some control on the government. They can do elections, uh, elect the representatives, and uh, then do uh, force the government to do the right thing. Now we have. Uh, more information with internet, maybe too much, uh, but anyway, all the information are there, and the people reading them, and it becomes uh, more and more dissatisfaction. It's uh, like probably like Andy uh, reads a lot books, internet, and uh, I think he is probably the most uh, dissatisfied person in this room, and. Uh, wants to change the world. So, uh, people really have lots of detailed knowledge about the government, so they want to detail control of the government, and they want to control right now, not once every four years. That's uh, that's waste of time, and uh, since God becomes irrelevant uh, after that. So, what we what I think we're really looking for is the direction of uh, direct democracy. Uh, direct, um, direct democracy, uh, probably most of people have some knowledge about that. It's in Switzerland, people do the uh, voting referendum uh, all the time to make uh, decide on issues. So a good thing about this is uh, there's no losers. At the election, you don't. There's no say election for once every four years. If you lost, then you have no voice. The direct democracy. Everybody has a voice. Although they are losing bills, there's some bills passed, some bills failed, but uh, uh, people or the voters are not losers. I don't like uh, to be losers. And uh, there's no middleman. Uh, the middleman usually becomes the target of uh, lobbyists, the, the cooperation to to change their, their war, uh, world, uh, to change towards their benefit. Uh, it's against uh, all the voters' uh, citizens' benefit. And uh, I think uh, this democracy need really need right now. And the need is from the technology advancement. And we should really use the same technology advancement to solve the problem, to create a way for people to vote directly to uh, So with the internet technology. The internet voting is happening right now. Like in Switzerland, they do have a direct democracy. So in year 2000, they started looking into this uh, technology. And uh, they gradually form a system and uh, with limited people uh, to vote. And uh, now, uh, they are at the stage, uh, they have uh, about 10%. They have three areas for the pilot study for trials. It's not nationwide. It's uh, only three areas. Uh, in Switzerland, and uh, they allow about 10% of the vote to be through the internet, and I think all the others probably still the traditional way. 
those 10% are mostly uh, remote people. They are away from their home or they're away from their country. <coughs> so it works, uh, looks so far so good. They're trying to expand that. And uh, another example is, uh, is in Estonia. Uh, since uh, 2005, Estonia actually had um, uh, uh, allowed the internet vote uh, to occur every two years. They are not a demo direct democracy system. They are still representative uh, democracy system like us. So every two years they have uh, uh, election vote their representatives, but they allowed internet voting. And uh, the reason they, they can do that is uh, every citizen have a smart card, smart ID card. Smart ID card has a chip or uh, so it can be used uh, uh, probably in a more secured way to uh, use the internet to do the voting. Uh, currently there are about a quarter of the voters uh, who cast ballots are using internet. So it's a pretty good number and that this is also nationwide. Although there are some people in, in that country say uh, this uh, internet voting is not secure enough but uh, I think uh, in general uh, most people satisfy that. They think it's good. Then in UK I think there's a party. Uh, within the party, they do this direct voting through the phone or through the internet. And uh, then uh, every issue, the party members uh, do the voting and uh, their, the party representative in the parliament will cast the vote according to what the, uh, the result of the internet and the phone voting. So these are all examples uh, for internet voting. I think uh, uh, it's a good start, and uh, we'll see more. I just have one question. Sure. Now, um, who owns the internet in these, in these countries? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it controlled like a public utility, or is it privately owned? I think it's uh, privately owned. And uh, but there are lots of owners, and uh, there are regulations also. Uh, so it's uh, it's not like post office owned by a government. It's a uh, or telephone. Uh, yeah, it's like telephone. Telephone is owned by a private. Uh, no, telephone is a public utility. Yeah, it's public utility, but owned by a private uh, organization. Okay. All right. That's okay. Uh, I like a short answer. So if you just are looking for short answers, then uh, uh, is the moderator. All right. Okay. And uh, the problem with uh, direct democracy is uh, overwhelming to most people. Everybody think about, oh, I have to vote on every issue, so it's, oh, it's a nightmare. I couldn't even read through the ballot, uh, which has uh, several pages. Uh, uh, don't ask me to read something like uh, Obama here has 2,000 pages. And uh, so it may not be acceptable for most of people, but uh, it's an a, a idea. And there are some other criticism about the mob, direct democracy. They say that it's a mob, mob democracy. I think for those people, they just uh, don't like uh, uh, new things. They, they want uh, they are conservatives. Uh, I think in the uh, in 3,000 years ago, they probably prefer monarchies than the new democracy system at the time. So don't be afraid of change. Uh, oh, we're not. <laughs> yeah, this group is not. Uh, yeah. So this is something probably in between direct democracy and the current uh, uh, representative democracy. 
I think in, in the net, on the internet it says a delegated or liquid democracy. It's uh, probably easier to understand right now, just delegated uh, democracy. So uh, it's between the right and the representative. There's no losers like uh, direct democracy. Everybody uh, can voice uh, their, their opinion anytime. And uh, there are middlemen, but uh, the middlemen uh, is under your control. Okay, you can choose which middlemen anytime, and uh, if you don't like the middlemen, you, you just change it. So this kind of delegative uh, democracy has happened uh, also in many countries. Uh, in small scale, though, I don't see anything in big scale. Uh, it's in uh, Sweden. Uh, they, they have a, They all depend on certain some kind of software. The thing in parentheses is uh, the the name of the software. Uh, that's okay. I just just a, a list of names: uh, Germany, Italy, France. Uh, Norway, uh, Spain, uh, Belgium, Canada, Netherlands, Australia, they all have some kind of uh, dedicated democracy going on there. It uh, may not be the same, may not use the same software, but uh, uh, if you look up the internet and uh, uh, the Wikipedia, you can find them. So, in more detail about the delegative uh, democracy. So basically, everyone can be a delegate or choose a delegate. And uh, there's no term limit for those delegates. And uh, you can change any time you want. And you feel the, the delegate is not, no, no longer good, I can change it. The delegate can be a person or can be a group. Okay, uh, if it's a group, it can be a, a special interest group, like uh, some environmental group, uh, Sierra Club, or some general interest group. Uh, they, it covers everything like nowadays, the uh, Democratic Party or Republican Party. So it can be, have a different form. And uh, then you can give, uh, you can assign multiple delegates on different topics. Okay, for this topic, for education, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, special, one special interest group uh, to voice for me or for the other uh, environmental issues, I'll, I'll assign my friend uh, to be the delegate. And uh, so that, and also with priorities, you probably want a, a cover to catch all the issues at the end. So you may have a Democratic Party or Republican Party at the bottom. So if uh, the issues fall into the crack, uh, no special interest group uh, looking for that, then uh, it's, you still got uh, a voice there. So if you look from uh, your personally, what you can do uh, is uh, you can choose a delegate. If I'm a voter, I can choose a delegate. It's easier for me. Uh, somebody I trust, I, I have him to vote for me. Uh, you can choose uh, your mom, your dad, your spouse. Uh, I don't know why not, but uh, uh, you can choose them and for your life. Then uh, once you choose that uh, for your life, uh, decided that, then you can, you can not worry about politics anymore. So that's the easy, right? Uh, that's the extreme. Uh, choice. Or you can be a delegate. Uh, be a delegate of yourself. You can go to vote by yourself. Then you are the delegate for yourself. 
or you can be a delegate for some other people, for your kids, for your parents, for your friends, uh, if they trust you. And uh, you can vote on certain issues by yourself. You think, I know best, I want. And uh, other issues you can delegate to some other people or group. Uh, you think they have more uh, uh, per, uh, expertise on, on those issues. So, another thing I would like to add, this one is I didn't find in, in the literature or internet, but uh, it may be there, but I just thought on some important issues, like constitution, like the name of the country, like the name of the state, or the border of the country, the border of the city, state, and those are important issues. You don't want to say, I passed the, the, the issue today and then I got reversed tomorrow or next year. You don't want to see those uh, flip-flop happening. So for important issues, I would like to say, if it's overwhelming support, more than 70% uh, voted mm. for this issue, then go ahead, if you pass the issue, it's yeah. constitutional, it's, uh, it's very important, but you've got uh, strong support. If only medium support, like 60%, okay, uh, I would like to give uh, uh, voters another chance to consider, say, two years later or four years later, we do it again and uh, see how much support we got. If uh, we got both more than 60%, uh, then we pass the issue. If we only get barely past 50%, then probably people have to seek more, more seriously, and uh, for long-term stability, and uh, we like to have this uh, being uh, voted, say, four times, and uh, consecutively, if they all got passed uh, by 50%, okay, uh, go for it. I think uh, this is uh, good if more than uh, the majority can always have uh, 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 a recognized uh, uh, voice. Uh, one thing, like in the current constitution amendment, I heard that uh, women's right uh, amendment has been dragged for 20, 30 years, and uh, most of the states have passed and uh, probably population-wise also more, more, most of the population has passed that, but the criteria is so high, so difficult, even majority, most of the states, most of the people all like that happen, but it's not happening. I, I would like to have some rule change uh, for those issues. Okay, it sounds complicated. It's, uh, uh, if you want to put this in, in work, uh, I'm sure there are more details, complicated details there. Uh, but uh, I think uh, with the modern technology, internet, computer, software, hardware, and uh, everybody got this smartphone, and uh, uh, we can do this easily. The difficult part, computer will take care of, and uh, for us, it's uh, probably just like uh, your TV, you want to set up something, set up the, the uh, TV box, and, uh, uh, and the, that's kind of uh, required knowledge. And uh, of course, at the beginning, we have to do lots of experiment trials. So uh, we want to start at small level, like uh, say a homeowner association. That's basically a very small government, and uh, uh, or local government, or 
a portion of the party uh, uh, section, like a, a party. Within the party, you can do something uh, uh, experiment like that. <coughs> oh yeah, the, the previous uh, second point uh, rely on internet with strong security. I think uh, when everybody talk about internet, security, 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 everybody is thinking about it's not reliable, I won't dare to put my voice through that and it got twisted uh, in the middle. Uh, internet security, it's, uh, it's there. It's uh, not 100%, but uh, it's getting better and better. And uh, we have uh, technology, although we have hackers, but uh, we know what hackers are uh, doing. Maybe we haven't find the hacker uh, in advance uh, before they did some damage, but uh, if they did some bad damage, usually we can find out. And. Uh, this, I feel the security uh, uh, problem is mostly for older generation because older generation don't know how to deal with computers and all the technologies. The young generation, they, they gave them a, you gave them a, a smartphone, they just stop playing and then even five years old, they, they stop playing uh, without any instruction and uh, then they can learn very fast. For older generation, we have to, I have to ask my son how to do it, ah. how to do that. And uh, don't do too fast because I couldn't follow. And I have to, uh, it's just uh, not there. But younger generation, they learn by heart and uh, naturally. And they know how to deal with uh, antivirus in the computer. They they know how to deal with spam in the email. They they see that's that's nothing. Just like uh, when we drive a car, some people, older people, very old generation, they may think, uh, oh, a car is going so fast, it's dangerous. Then uh, for this generation, we drive cars all the time. We think, oh, we, I know how to handle that. Yeah, accident, it happens, but uh, uh, it's under control. The benefit is much greater than the, uh, the risk. In the future, probably internet is also like that. The younger generation say, says, uh, yeah, I, I know how to deal with that. There are enough experts. and. Uh, uh, the benefit is so great that uh, I don't really care about the risk. Uh, one thing I think, just for example, how to overcome this uh, internet security. Uh, if I cast a vote, how do you know the vote has been counted correctly? And uh, here is a, a, a one solution I'm thinking. If I have a smart device, a cell phone, or a computer, once I hit the keystroke, uh, cast a vote, the signal, the message was sent to two places. Okay, two places, same message is controlled by my computer, my device. So I should know, I better know this is a, is a good device. Once well, sends out the message to different uh, location, and uh, two different uh, systems will count the ballots. At the end of the day, you just compare the ballot counts between the two systems. If they are the same, then probably nothing goes wrong. The hacker, um, because these two systems uh, may be totally different, the hacker may be able to get into one system, but uh, to get into both systems, the possibility is much lower. And they have to really balance the count to so make them match. That's uh, also difficult. So that's uh, one way to beat the security problem. And uh, if you still don't trust the internet, that's fine. In Canada, they have a way 
why it's a secret ballot. It's open ballot. In, the, in that party where they cast a vote, the vote result posts on the web page. Who did what? Who did what? It's there. Everybody can read it. You can verify your own, and everybody can verify everybody else. And uh, so it's impossible to just solve the security problem right away. No more security problem. But you have to sacrifice the privacy or secrecy of your vote. I think uh, the secret vote is probably necessary for voting for person because person is uh, when you look at the person whether I, I trust the person or not. It's uh, it's very hard to decide and uh, they are it's very objective when you vote for a person. But if you vote for issues like bills or referendum or those should be leave it open. Everybody can voice their opinion and uh, defend their own uh, votes. So this may be a solution for for legislative voting. Okay, vote for certain laws uh, in public. So that's just some idea about the security. Uh, that's a. Uh, all the things I, I mentioned about the legislative uh, branch, now the executive branch. I think uh, every government still need a person, or if you can say a representative or a middleman, but still need a person to represent the uh, government and the, the, the uh, region, the country or the province or the state. So, to elect the executive officer, uh, probably still using secret ballot and uh, with a term limit and uh, still the old fashion. Uh, probably he also need the veto power to keep all the laws in coherent fashion because the direct democracy probably result uh, say, oh, everybody for lowering taxes. But on the other hand, uh, everybody is voting for higher, uh, raise the, the, the uh, uh, expenses or services, services exactly. <laughs> so that, that caused a conflict. And uh, in order to get a coherent, cohesive, uh, coherent decision and the executive uh, may have some limited veto power there just like right now and uh, then in terms of the judicial branch uh, my thought current my thought is uh, it's a special area special profession and uh, I would prefer let that uh, group of people uh, to manage their own organization. Basically, the judicial branch wants to interpret the law in a consistent manner, consistent over all the branches or, or, or all the judges and the consistent throughout the history. So uh, last year, this year, next year, the, it's consistent. Uh, and this is more like, uh, to me, it's more like academic exercise. So I see this branch is more like an academic group of uh, uh, a group of academic people. They they can set their own rules and uh, uh, how they set up the who is, who is the local court judges and the uh, regional court judges and the supreme court judges and. Uh, uh, got their own system as long as they do the a good thing about the interpret law consistently. And also they can provide some advice on the proposed laws. So say the new laws being proposed, they are not contradict to the constitution or conflict with other laws. 
So, here's summary. It's almost time. Yeah. Late, late thing, let's get, get wrapping okay. up. So, the internet gave us more information. We now have more opinions uh, about uh, the government and the more dissatisfaction because our opinions goes nowhere. Current democrat democratic system lags behind the technology. The technology moving faster. The democracy system is, I don't know, 100 years, 200 years old. Not, no much, much changes there. So, how urgent is to change that? I think it's uh, urgent. We want to change it to make the democracy successful. Because right now we don't have uh, a competing, uh, uh, a rival competing about the political system uh, as a communist. But if you look at China, if you look at uh, Singapore, in China there's no voting at all. In Singapore, there are vote, voting elections, but it's highly controlled. The information, the government uh, has a very strict control on all the newspaper, on, the, on all the media. So they are quite successful right now, China and Singapore and uh, some other countries coming up. They may not have a, a high degree of democratic system, but uh, their economy is booming. And uh, basically, they still have an uh, authoritarian system, uh, central controlled government, but with capitalism or free market economy. That makes this country booming right now. If you look at uh, us right now, we have a highly degree of uh, democratic system, but economy-wise, U.S. probably the best in the developed country. In Europe and Japan, they are they are going nowhere. Okay. So economy-wise, uh, uh, the democratic world is not very good. Even U.S. is not very good than the most many people would complain. Like China, they have the high-speed rail. Uh, Charlie probably has um, lots of knowledge on that. And uh, China, if you know, they have the highest, the fastest uh, supercomputer right now. U.S. used to dominate the supercomputer industry for since the computer started, and uh, until I think either last year or a year ago. China took the first place. And uh, according to the information I know, within next couple of years, U.S. has no way to catch up. Because China not only has the current fastest uh, supercomputer, they're also building the next generation. And the U.S. is not doing that. So, uh, we, I think uh, I still have very much confidence about democracy. I think it's good, it's better, uh, but we have to quickly do something to improve on that. Thank you. All right. Doesn't your proposal mandate uh, that democracy of uh, the, the internet or become a utility that it becomes a possibility? Karina, could you repeat your question, please? Yeah, I, I would like to see that. Yeah, I would like to see internet as a, uh, being like uh, the old age telephone. Uh, it's, it's 
being supported uh, in the rural area uh, and also available for almost everybody. Are you good? Yeah. We're, I'm Turkish, so we're neighbors. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, I'd like, uh, I'll get that. I get the pasta. Pasta, you get super salad with that. Charlie? What kind of soup y'all got? Yeah, Lynn, I'm a lobbyist for the Independent Voters of Illinois. And at any given time, there's over 2,000 pieces of legislation pending. And it's next to impossible for me to even keep, have a little knowledge of any of those. Yes, sir. And a congressman needs a staff of about half a dozen people. And we're not even talking about the state and the local like, government. Are you sure? Uh, how about some soup? But how in the world do you envision the RQ citizen to make any meaningful choices on this legislation, a decision? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a big problem uh, if you look at uh, the volume of uh, the bills. And uh, it's uh, tremendous, and uh, every bill is so complicated. But on the other hand, if, to me, the law is written to be followed by people, if uh, it's uh, to be followed by general people, general public, I think the law should be written as simple as possible. should not be complicated uh, for general public to comprehend. So that's, uh, the first thing is to simplify the law system, to make it simple. And uh, the second is uh, uh, we have special interest group, and uh, certainly online there will be uh, lots of discussions on all the issues. If you can handle them, you handle whatever you, you, you would like. If you feel you don't have time and uh, you couldn't handle that, then you just uh, find the best delegate to uh, to, to be pointed. Just a follow-up. Is our society sure. getting more complex? Right. Or is it getting more simple, like the Middle Ages or something? What do you, what do you mean? Society's getting incredibly complex. We've got right. difficult issues. So, How do you make that simple? What, cartoons? So, I think uh, one thing, law should be written for the general public. And uh, in and uh, I think uh, current law probably there are lots of building loopholes and uh, those should be certainly get rid of uh, to make the law as simple as possible. But still, like you said, the society is getting more and more complicated. And uh, then uh, I think uh, delegations and the special interest group it is needed and especially for laws for uh, a portion of the group, like uh, the law for financial professionals, mm -hmm. the law for uh, uh, doctors, or just if the law apply to a certain small group of people, then, then uh, general public uh, don't have to worry about. It. Yes. Okay. Um, Butler. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, as you know, a lot of bills before Congress are what are known as private bills. Uh, they are bills designed for the consideration of one individual or group of individuals. That's not necessarily bad. Let's say you own a farm in Texas and you need an easement so that you can have a, a highway go through your farm to deliver and pick up your goods and cattle. Um, and since it's federal property, that would require an act of Congress. It happens all the time. It happens every day. Uh, what prevents, when you have a case of everybody is only congressman, and you have no way of keeping track from day to day who is representing who or what or why, what prevents uh, some of the more unscrupulous amongst us from offering a consideration to the guy next to him saying, if you will vote for Joe Blow's easement, 
I will vote for uh, you know something else that you want. Uh, it's horse trading. It goes on all the time. But traditionally, our horse trading has been done in Congress by people who know exactly what they're doing for good or for ill. When you turn this, when you turn this over to 300,000 amateurs, don't you risk uh, an absolutely chaotic situation if you think we're having problems now, uh, awaken to the nightmare of the 22nd century? Yeah, I think uh, for those kind of problems, uh, maybe the government should uh, have a special organization to uh, collect uh, the needs and the, the uh, to to work on those. I don't know whether that should be uh, part of the direct democracy or direct vote, uh, but uh, that's just my opinion. I'm not uh, very familiar with uh, the special issues follow up on that. Sure. We've got three branches of government mandated by the Constitution of the United States. Which branch of government would be would that special agency be a uh, part of? And how would that be overseen? Uh, I would think it's uh, still the, the executive branch. The, the legislative branch probably provides some basic rules for how that branch should work, and uh, then people try to follow that rules, and the, the executive branch will make some to organize to make things happen. So, aren't you taking aren't you taking the powers that currently exist in the legislative branch, the one we're all closest to, uh, and aren't you taking those powers? placing him in the hands of the president, uh, who some would say already has more powers than the founders of this country intended uh, 225 years ago. Uh, to me, I think uh, nothing is sacred. A constitution, no matter how long it has been there, if it needs to be changed, go ahead to change it. But uh, uh, as long as people understand uh, and uh, what's the consequence or or maybe just uh, uh, think it worthwhile to try to change the constitution and uh, then uh, make the change. Uh, Although it's, uh, as I suggest, it's a serious matter. Uh, but uh, basically, people have to make the decision. And uh, of course, some people have to take the initiative to initiate some ideas how this should be done and to promote that, and then people whether follow or reject. Okay. Uh, Tim Bolger and then Mary Bennett. Lee, you know, you, what you're describing already has been implemented in the governance of a lot of major corporations. You have one piece of stock, you have one vote, you have the power of the proxy, you have the directors, the board of directors who are appointed by the stockholders, and yet you say that this type of system, basically what you're proposing then is a corporate type of governance system on uh, on the United States of America, don't we have enough problems with uh, corporate governance now? And why would you want to impose this then on the uh, people of the U.S.? I think uh, uh, the difference between corporate and the government is uh, corporate, or this at least in the U.S. in this uh, capitalism uh, society. Corporate has only one purpose, it's uh, making money. It's uh, money is the, the, the way to say your success or fail. So the objective is very clear. For government, there's no clear objectives. Just suits the people's need and uh, whatever the best. And uh, the 
technology, yes, the corporate world already uses those technologies. Why not? We should use also. Yes, uh, there have been uh, serious concerns, you know, about the use of technology that is used in the electoral process already. You know, uh, the, the emergence of provisional voting and, uh, and whether they are counted. See, you you are assuming a lot that the internet is going to, you know, uh, has the built-in integrity to count these votes, you know, in, a, in an accurate manner. And I feel very uncomfortable with the whole idea of not having a paper trail, you know, in, in situations where you've got close elections. You know, so that's, you know, point number one. Your, your proposal doesn't address the current dysfunction with the Liberal system right now. The, uh, the, the influence of big money, you know, in our elections. And uh, corporations have been known to use government to further their profit motive. So uh, I just don't see how your, your system addresses those core problems that have emerged in the last, what, 15, 20 years? You know, right now? Yeah, uh, I can understand your point. And uh, uh, the first pro problem uh, about the security, well, internet uh, can avoid some old uh, problems, but uh, yeah. it brings some new problems, definitely. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what I said is the problem is being addressed by uh, different organization and the different uh, uh, technology development. So I see uh, it's, a, it's a very good uh, technology which can provide easy, direct uh, voting for everybody. Uh, if you feel still that uh, you need a paper, paper trail, Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. We can have uh, both systems working at the same time, like uh, Estonia and uh, Switzerland. They have traditional voting and uh, the internet voting uh, going on at the same time. The only thing is uh, for the people voting voted uh, in paper, uh, I hope they have some confidence about the people voted in the internet is not screwing up the <laughs> results. But uh, I think gradually, with more and more young people, they just feel naturally comfortable about the internet. And uh, <coughs> the, yeah. yeah. And, and to follow up on what you said, I think I would, Maybe the, feel, the second. I would feel more comfortable if the, uh, the internet that manages, you know, counting the voting was a public source kind of system. That is, you don't have any compelling private in interest in the outcome of any election. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case right now. I don't see how it's possible. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, there are some uh, examples they use open source uh, mm -hmm. software. Those are basically in public. They, they are not uh, <laughs> Uh, produced by any organization. Yeah, it's an organization, but really non-profit organization. All the people, they wrote the code, uh, they are all volunteers. And that all the code is published, uh, everybody can access that to, to extend that, uh, make sure there's no, no problem there. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a way to to do that in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And the, the other, the second uh, <coughs> you have the corporate, corporate influence on the current system. I think in the delegated democracy, <coughs> lobbyist has no 
place to go. Yeah, they, they can form the special interest group, but uh, it will be basically they have to be selected by the by the voters to be their delegate. So the lobby, the corporate lobby uh, target should be just general public. Yeah. So if uh, our media or the TV station major uh, media organizations being controlled by few people, that's still a problem because uh, they are directly influenced on the general I think public. You've got five newspaper chains uh, nationwide, plus you, you know, for reporter, you know, the start against. So there are a whole bunch of problems. Thank you. David Zucker, and then uh, Ernie uh, Zorich. All right, my questions are too full. Yeah, first of all, Patrick Butler spoke to the point earlier when he was talking about the Louder, please. Now, in Chicago, we used to have a mayor who was in charge of that. His name was Richard J. Daly. That's number one. Number two, my question to you is, often under Mayor Daly, and even now, we have elections in which nobody is opposing the candidates public office. Like, for example, we have a Democratic <coughs> slate running for county office and no Republicans. Does that constitute democracy? Uh, that's probably more similar to what happened in Singapore. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's highly controlled by whatever means. Yeah. It's a lower degree of the democracy. Well, let me go over here. Yes. Uh, how do you propose to make the current powers that be accept such a system? Uh, or do you have some other means by which you would uh, uh, implement such a system? Yeah, that's a good, very good question because uh, Ted, uh, yeah, Ted mentioned uh, 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 we probably need a revolution uh, to change the system. We, I hope not, uh, especially uh, I hope uh, it's a peaceful change. The first thing we probably want to do is to change all the representative to like more like a delegative. That is, uh, in for example, right now there are uh, how many congressmen in Illinois? Eighteen or something? Mm -hmm. Less than there used to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's say uh, 18 congressmen uh, from Illinois. So there are 18 uh, district, each district only select one uh, winner. What I would like to see is uh, maybe reduce that 18 to 9. So every district can have two uh, representatives. And their vote cast in the Congress is based on proportion to the, what the votes they got in the general election. So if you win more votes in the general election, like 60%, uh, then in the Congress, you, your vote is uh, more powerful than the other guy uh, with only 40%. Or even we can reduce the Illinois Congress district to uh, a third of 18 and six. So we have uh, probably three people uh, can represent each district to Congress to cast their vote. And uh, so making uh, fewer and fewer people being the loser. Okay. And uh, from there, to lower the threshold and uh, then maybe uh, not only three people can go to DC but uh, another ten people can vote through the internet without going to DC, something like that. So it's a transition uh, I'm, I'm thinking so to avoid the revolution. Okay. Uh, Rita? Uh, I was confused about the relationship between the, the executive officer and this direct democracy. What's the point of direct democracy if they have veto power and can just veto whatever the public comes up with? Isn't that just like a, a benevolent monarchy? 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, legislative, uh, what we direct democracy, we vote on issues. Okay. We for a government, you always need a, a leader of the government. Right now, I, I see president we selected is not the leader of the country. They, he is the representative of the country. Uh, but he is the leader of the government. He leads the government to do things, to make things happen. And uh, for that position, I see there's a need for that, uh, to represent the government, to represent the, the whole uh, region and uh, to lead the government. So executive branch still, I, I think, need a, 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 a person to be elected. Is that the thing? Mm -hmm. your, your question? That makes the government separate from the people. You're saying the government is separate from the people. There's the people yeah, the yeah, the government is uh, doing government to do the service do they want. for the people. Ernie Norman? Oh, yeah. oh, all right. Uh, you may have mentioned this, sir, um, in specific, but you make the assertion that in our modern age, democracy is successful. You say that perfunctorily. I was wondering if you might explain where in practice you would say such democracy works. You mean modern democracy, the system we have right now? That was the one that you said was so successful. Yeah, that's uh, uh, for the last, uh, if you look at the history for the last 238 years. Can you give us specific examples where this democracy works? Well, in this country it worked uh, successfully until I think uh, until the internet was born. Before the internet was born, the people are, in general, happy about the government. So when the Vietnam War was raging, democracy was successful then? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And the, the, the government changed the, the Nixon, uh, yeah. basically, being pressured by the people to get out of the Vietnam. What? Yeah. Is that right? No. After three million Vietnamese were murdered, that was democracy working? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's not working perfectly, but uh, it's working to a certain extent. The government uh, Any uh, other examples besides the United States? Because anybody with two brain cells to rub together knows this is not a democracy. Well, uh, hold your Any other examples other besides the United States? Scandinavian countries, England, all kinds of places. European yeah, economic yeah, community. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> if uh, you just compare the democratic countries uh, after the Second World War, uh, it works beautifully in contrast to the communist country or any other system. All right, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we, I'm for social democracy. Yeah. Social democracy uh, may not follow Gary. geographical lines of, of states, uh, municipalities, or uh, nations, uh, it might be you, the democracy dear. of a family. Uh, it's a matter of communication, the participation uh, within uh, a society and mutual respect and uh, the uh, functionality of that. Uh, uh, Karl Marx, for instance, uh, suggested that uh, 
the way to uh, social freedom was through uh, uh, workers' associations and uh, production and uh, uh, consumer associations uh, for uh, consumers and, uh, you know, the savings associations, all kinds of free associations of people. Now, they're not all going to work by the internet, are they? They, but most would probably employ the means of communication available to them. Uh, and uh, the question is, how do you get to democracy in a family or a church or a, a union or uh, there are or in, in the marketplace? Uh, you have consumer co-ops, you have uh, producer co-ops, you have uh, banks that are owned by the, uh, the savers or the uh, 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 people who are uh, utilizing them. Uh, yeah, I think democracy is a much bigger uh, subject than the uh, policy of uh, of Chicago or, or the nation. Yeah, I think uh, right currently the political system are mostly geographically based. So every government has a geographic area, a unique area, and the area uh, a specific geographic location is under uh, one uh, government at certain level. So uh, what uh, Brown uh, talking about is social organizations. Uh, they, all, they all can have uh, democracy and uh, they probably will have uh, democracy before the current political system because uh, they have, uh, uh, people may have uh, less concern about uh, sec internet security. Uh, I know uh, by reading the internet, I know some university, they have uh, experiment all their student organizations uh, using some software to do uh, one of the direct democracy uh, <coughs> Uh, as a, their organization uh, structure. Yeah, we have local school councils, for instance, or, or you might have uh, people uh, in a carpool sharing uh, uh, decision making about how they get to work. Uh, but, yeah. uh, I think uh, in terms of I using. I see it solved by the internet. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, yeah. Internet uh, cannot solve uh, directly solving issues. It's just a very convenient communication tool to be used if you feel comfortable with that. Many people don't feel comfortable with that. I know my my in Bruce and my colleagues still don't use cell phone. Uh, probably there are people in this room not using cell phone either. <laughs> I saw a hand raised over there. You know what, sweetheart? I have a question. Um, do you have any suggestions to address the problem with democracy where we have you know, what would you do about the high concentration of criminals we have running our government right now compared to a much lesser concentration of criminals in Sweden or Switzerland or Norway? You know, those are all democracies. Why has America become dominated by criminals? And what can we do about it? That's my question. Is that a good question? Yeah, I think uh, that's a problem in U.S. and uh, probably even a bigger problem in countries like China, all the, all the bribery and corruption is over there. Over there, it's, uh, the corruption is in terms of uh, millions or, or hundreds of millions of dollars. 
He is uh, like a, probably thousands of dollars. It's, uh, it's corrupted. Uh, I think that those problems, uh, the best way is uh, to keep everything open. I think uh, for public affair or the government uh, or the public government uh, shouldn't have secret. Uh, people can have secret. The government, what the government do, shouldn't have secret. If they really need secret for defense or for some uh, police or, or something, they can have secret for a while, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe 10 years, and uh, they should uh, leave those, uh, they should keep whatever the government do on record and the release after uh, the secrecy expires. Okay. Wow. I think that probably keep the, uh, pub, keep everything uh, in the open public. Okay. We're All right. Uh, Charlie Paydock. Yeah, Lynn, you place a great deal of the basis of your entire system are people using information on the internet, and I'm an old school librarian, and I can go home tonight, and I can put up a website that is absolute and total fiction, and that fiction will be relied upon conceivably under your system by millions of people to base the public policy of our nation. There's no control whatsoever. Right. And this is what you're recommending we do? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm not recommending... I mean, there are people on the internet, it's inflated. Right. People are looking at cat videos and celebrities gibberish. Right. <laughs> and now all of a sudden they're going to be reading Federal Reserve legislation, right? Right. I think. Uh, well, I don't want to read about this guy who was raping the is, girls. I'm going to. I'm this, gonna is read this. What, uh, this is not Come what on. I advocate, but this is truth. This is the reality. On the internet, there are lots of garbage there. And uh, everybody should treat, should censor the, the, what you read there. And uh, I think for. For older generations, we reading books. If you can publish a book uh, five, 50 years ago, you are probably a recognized person and uh, you can publish a book. It's difficult and you can write a book and the, the content of the book must be true, must be good, must be valuable. But nowadays, uh, on the internet, uh, Everybody can put that, anything on there. So, in, in my generation, my wife uh, or some of my friends are uh, reading the internet. They see those uh, crazy things. They say, are they real? I say, no, 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 no. The, the, the internet is, uh, uh, have lots of fake stuff and the bad stuff and they you don't uh, treat it like a, a book we used to read. Nowadays, of course, a book is easy to publish. You have used word processor, type something, and then there are online companies that will publish for you. But uh, 50 years ago, book is very valuable. You only read and uh, seriously, and uh, the people who write the book also write seriously. But today is totally different. So there are lots of dis dissatisfaction. And uh, what I can suggest is uh, change your mentality. This is the real world. It's not a perfect world. And uh, there's no perfect way to do things. And uh, the internet is not certainly not perfect. But if you look at the kids, and the uh, kids, they, they go to the internet, it seems they know what's real, what's non-real, what's is laughable, what's... Uh, uh, they, they, at least they feel they know. They may not know exactly. Okay.
We ought to get we ought to get in the rebuttal. <laughs> well, it's about eight ten right now. We should be getting into rebuttals pretty quick. How many people have rebuttal remarks to make? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to raise both hands because I deserve twice as much. All right. Uh, I would say we, we have about uh, four minutes of peace. All right. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you. 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 I, I'm going to have everything in focus real quick. Okay, here we go. Oh, you want to start? Yes, sir. I'm in favor of reform. You know, Lee, it's interesting what you came up with because these discussions were done about 300 years, I'm sorry, less than 200 years ago by the Constitutional Convention of our United States when they went to debate the... Um, the thing, and they concluded that representative democracy may have been the best way to go forward. I contend that, you know, even though you're trying to solve a problem, that the diagnosis you're making that a democracy isn't working is, is, is not just, just not true. I think a lot of it is because of four problems that America is facing right now. The first one's globalization, the second one's the information, the revolution of information technology. Third is the chronic debt we're facing, and fourth is our pattern of energy consumption. And I firmly believe that uh, one of the reasons we're doing this is just not so much a result of our governing structure, but a lot more of a result of our culture. You know, the dumbing down of the American people, the lack of education being taken care of, our chronic... Uh, laziness and, and, and getting things done. Americans in the 60s used to used to build things. Instead of selling off our seed corn, we used to build things. We used to make things. Whatever happened to this taking and putting a man on the moon? Whatever happened to uh, getting together and going for a grand purpose or doing something else? It is not my contention that American governance is wrong. I think the people and the culture that America has today with the me generation is what really is at the root of all of our troubles these days. There's nothing wrong with individual liberty or individual effort or even individual recognition. But there was also in the past, up until a, maybe about 30 years ago, a very strong sense of community in the United States. Matter of fact, that Tocqueville had mentioned that America was a society of joiners. They joined organizations. They got together for a common purpose. And there was a lot more than just this me first attitude that's permeating society today. Granted, we've seen a lot of introduction of collaborative technologies, the internet being one of them. It would not exist today without the collaboration of a lot of countries, laws, and the re requests for crap and, uh, and other things. But I think as a society, we're a lot more self-centered than we were a few years ago. And I think the only really way we're going to change that is, you know, just getting back to some very basics of what, we, what we've done. China's rediscovered what we used to do, and that's why they're successful. We've got to get back to work. We need to get back to innovating things and building things again. We need to tax our level of services to the, we need to make taxes applicable to the level of services that we want in government. And then with our pattern of energy consumption, we need to figure out a way to get off oil. I'm not going to get into the, what I call the nuclear option here, but, you know, there is a lot of things that can be done. And I don't think it's going to require a change in government. I think it requires more of a change in culture. Mm -hmm. oh, boy. Uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I admit I'm one who's really weak on the computer, so I, I'm not too interested in that sort of system. But it probably will come. Uh, we've talked a little bit in the past about the Nordic countries, and 
uh, certainly in the Christian Science Monitor, I think it was about uh, May or something, they had an article about the Nordic countries. It's interesting that these Nordic countries are all capitalistic countries like we are. Uh, however, uh, they are seem to be more successful in a lot of ways and more democratic and have more equality than uh, we do. So uh, I find this interesting. Of course, a lot of people are saying, well, they're small, they don't have the diversity we have, and these are the reasons. But I think there's some other things about culture. I think they consider their communities more than our individuals. We're a bunch of individualists, or as Morris Berman said, uh, we're a bunch of hustlers in his book, uh, Why America Failed. Uh, uh, the speaker talked about uh, cumul uh, proportional representation. He didn't call it that, but that's what it was. The proportional representation helps people uh, uh, when a bunch of people vote, it helps them get that proportion of representatives that are represented by their vote. In fact, here in Illinois, we had such a system and there's probably three or four of us in the room that remember it very well. I remember it distinctly because what you had was at the, on the lower house, in other words, the house representative in uh, Illinois, you had the choice you could vote for one, two, or three representatives. If you voted for one, you, it was called a bullet vote. The result of that was there were Democrats in DuPage County, and there were uh, Republicans here in Chicago. I remember voting for a guy named Michael Abramson, who wasn't Jewish, incidentally. It was actually Catholic, I found out. But he was the Republican. I always voted for him because he wasn't in the Democratic machine. So that it, it gave people a choice. And one of the, uh, for those who are older, uh, you might remember William Redmond, who was a speaker of the House and one of one of the very best speakers. He was the guy who said about uh, James Thompson. James Thompson was like a little boy who smiled and sat in your lap and left a mess behind. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank the speaker. He did a lot of work and uh, very uh, astute uh, thinking, so I'd like to thank the speaker tonight. Uh, the problem with what he is uh, uh, proposing is, uh, <clears throat> for example, in the last election, one-third of the eligible voters voted, okay? Uh, the public um, <clears throat> and the percentage of those that were well-informed about the issues uh, is maybe about 10%. Uh, the, uh, it's nice that we have the internet, but you need uh, a, uh, an electorate, uh, like in Britain, that is uh, educated and astute and cares. And uh, you just don't have that, uh, except when there's an emergency. The <clears throat> real sol uh, solution uh, <clears throat> to uh, what is uh, going to happen is uh, indicated by the flow of legislation uh, currently. You have committees that uh, these people uh, spend a lifetime uh, trying to understand um, uh, the uh, issues involved, uh, say in uh, budgeting or uh, health care. Uh, and uh, then uh, <clears throat> the, there are so many laws uh, before the Congress that nobody can keep up with them. So they rely on, on the committees uh, and exceptional people like Dirk and we have in Illinois were lucky. Uh, and they, these people have a certain viewpoint socially. Uh, what are they trying to accomplish for society? And uh, they know the issues, they're well informed, uh, and we're lucky to have that handful. But uh, it's idiotic to assume that uh, these guys uh, that you know are going to be uh, able to do a careful job uh, and uh, work with actual legislation. My God, uh, 2,000 pages 
on uh, Obamacare. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not going to work. The real solution to what we want is found in Britain, where they have a, uh, <clears throat> a government that uh, <clears throat> it, it's, um, <clears throat> it has a name, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, instead of having a written constitution, they have a, a series of uh, customary things that are done. Uh, the real solution is to get back to the public um, when, there, when an issue arises that uh, the public uh, should vote on. Uh, and that, that can be uh, declared by uh, the, the uh, party in power. There's, a, there's an understanding in Britain uh, that uh, when they reach this point that they're going to have to call a general election. And it lasts about a month, uh, and uh, they spend, uh, I don't know, a million pounds or so. You compare that to this country, goddamn $4 billion to a congressional election. My God, what can you do with $4 billion? Uh, now, uh, we need the British system, flexible uh, elections, flexible terms, and a newspaper uh, the communication people that take their job seriously. What you have currently is, if a newspaper wants to survive, it needs the advertising of the Republican uh, group that, uh, that has their own private interest. And the last election was a good example of the uh, terrible confusion and stupidity that you get when you don't have a good communication system that um, the, the Republicans voted down, blocked everything that Obama tried to do, and then they went to the election saying the government doesn't work. You know, I mean, it, our present system is a disgrace. It has to be changed. It should be changed toward the British system. And hopefully an electorate, when, when every couple of years there's an election, they take it seriously and try to learn the issues. And you got to, uh, <clears throat> we don't have action in this country. You don't have, the, the Chinese, I'll just finish this sentence, the Chinese moving fast trains. You're not going to get that in this country. It's uh, <clears throat> our research. Your time is up. Okay. Our research. I very much enjoy your presentation, brother. Um, you'll forgive me for being rude. Due respect, but you've gone a long way toward bloviating a full spectrum of gibberish. But I did say, due respect, you too had a lot of valued insights, if for no other reason than you're taking seriously issues that need to be taken seriously, specifically what you refer to as participatory democracy. Your assertion that the internet is filled with crap may be true, but it misses the point. Because conversely, there's a lot of good stuff on the internet. Counterpunch, email, Facebook, real news, alternative news as a genre. I think that's an important thing we have to recognize. There's a lot of good shopping stuff, too, you know. Thanks, thanks Lee, for your uh, provocative. And and that's one of the best inventions in the world, uh, Charlie. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said in terms of uh, we need to move in the direction of democracy. Uh, I want to correct you on a couple of things, or at least one thing uh, that you said at the very beginning, <clears throat> that uh, we've had democracy in this country for 238 years, but we haven't. We have not uh, had democracy at all. We've had uh, oligarchy. The representative system is a form of oligarchy, a period, plain and simple. Uh, we went, it, historically, uh, the Western world has gone from monarchy to oligarchy. We have not reached democracy yet. Um, that's an important uh, stage that uh, you skipped. Um, I, and so, 
your issue, or uh, your assessment of the problem was uh, that we have a, 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 a problem with communication technology, <clears throat> that uh, that's the shortcoming. Um, I don't think that's the real problem at all. I think the problem is uh, uh, a problem of power. Ordinary people don't have power. In, in olden days, for instance, in, in Athens, uh, people met in the Agora, and they spoke on and uh, uh, talked, conversed on all kinds of important issues. They knew more about what was going on in neighboring countries than we do today about what's going on in neighboring countries, regardless of the internet. People would find ways to communicate. In uh, colonial America, uh, just before the revolution, people met in coffee houses. They read newspapers and they wrote. They read and wrote much more than we do today uh, to, in, to a large degree. Uh, nowadays, people get on the internet, they read two sentences and they think they know everything. <laughs> um, so I, uh, another problem with the internet, um, just like with your smartphone, quote unquote, smartphone, which is a misnomer because your goddamn phone isn't smart. It's not an intelligent thing. Okay, those things are black boxes. Um, the NSA, uh, besides ordinary hackers, the NSA can do a number on, on these uh, on systems Correct. in a minute. I think you were very cavalier in this uh, talk of yours about internet security. Internet security is a contradiction in terms. Okay, uh, who controls the internet? Who controls your your quote unquote smartphone? A whole bunch of programmers. Who, uh, you, do you control the programmers? We don't control the programmers. Um, that's, uh, that's a whole system that uh, we're, and we have to put our uh, quote-unquote democracy, our power into this system is to really seriously alienate it more than it, it already is. So we, I, I have a serious problem with this uh, question, business about uh, internet voting. I think we have to go to something very simple, which is people meeting in assemblies and discussing things and deciding things together. Um, the executive would be a random, uh, random sample council of ordinary people. Uh, that's a very simple human uh, system. Another thing, I just want to mention one more thing. Uh, the internet uh, can crash, right? Uh, every now and then it crashes. So the, uh, the powers that be decide, you know, before a uh, uh, very important vote about going to war here or there, well, oh, the internet crashed, you know? Or um, the voting machines, okay, ha have been hacked, have been proven to be hacked. Uh, 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 Good computer programmers have come out and said, um, you know, these things can be hacked. I can make them say, uh, yeah, I can, I can make them say X when the people say Y. Okay, this is proven. So these things, um, these systems, uh, technology systems, are no panacea at all. Thanks. I'm kind of concerned, as I stated before, about the integrity of the vote if we go to an internet system. Um, I'm very concerned about the integrity of the vote period in light of what has happened in the last election. Most notably, this, you know, the state of uh, uh, South Carolina in which the number of discarded votes exceeded the difference between the Republican and the Democratic candidate. So um, in a survey that Gregory Pallast had, had published on his uh, blog site in terms of the quality of our democracy, we ranked 25-26. Why are we not number one? Having voting by internet is not going to address the problems with the, that face our democracy right now. We have to address the problem of money in, in the political system. Yes, we need to guarantee the right to, to vote. All these voter suppression methods that have been going on in many states, you know, have certainly added to the deterioration of the democratic process. And we need to have free flow of information that is not happening right now. These airwaves are supposed to belong to the public and, and it's time to, to require the licensees to open up the process to a variety of point of views. And that I think would go a long way toward educating the public. I don't think that's happening right now. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, you know, everybody voting on everything. Thank you.
for your hospitality. This is great. Uh, listen to the great minds of the Western world here. And uh, I'd like to add a little bit from the Eastern world. Greece is a Greek name, Aristides Prokopiu Yanibas. My Hellenic American name is Eris of Chicago Yanibas. And my title is. I forgot, wait. Geopolitical, no wait, no. Pol political philosopher of geopolitical dimensions. So, your humble speaker, start with this. You know, democracy and imagination, salvation and imagination, American imagination, what's the other one? Well, anyway, the difference or sex and imagination. Okay, ah. imagination and copulation. Okay, I know a lot about the former, but a little about the latter. It's limited experience, but a lot of imagination. So in other words, American democracy is what imagination is, the copulation. Thank you, John. And also, like the Judeo-Christian civilization here based on salvation. Okay, it's, again, imagination but no salvation. So that is a couple of analogies. Maybe if I sit here a couple hours, I'll see some more. But the thing is, you know, uh, Lenin, the great Lenin, according to the socialists, said, uh, I read about 10 pages of Lenin, by the way. I'm people Lenin. here did know a lot more. <laughs> but you know, I remember one thing he said, uh, in uh, capitalist societies, governments are the executive committee of the Working capitalist class. ruling class. No, no. So he said the capitalists are the ruling class and the governments are the executive committee and that's Thank you, never man. been more visible than our day now. Yeah. So uh, they even went all the way from militarizing the United States and military uh, crimes all over the world. They militarized even our local police. The other day I had to show my venture card, five, six uh, welcoming committee over here at Rockwell Brown Line Station, policemen. They said, hey, show me your venture card. I said, well, hello, I'm not going to sit there and argue. I had to go downtown. So he looks at it, okay, he says, well, make sure you got the right picture of the holder. Well, this is, so no more Chicago Police Department, Chicago Military Police Department. <coughs> Same thing with the firemen. They're part of the espionage uh, Homeland Security apparatus. apparatus. So it's uh, home, uh, excuse me, uh, Chicago Military Fire Department. Same thing with education. 95% of those professors are working for the Pentagon, for other front organ organizations, uh, uh, as spies, as third world provocateurs and collaborators and stuff like that. I've seen, I did something on the inside. I've been, half of my life I spent in academia as a student because I was slow. It took me 10 years to get through three years. Of law. So other guys get through law school in three years. It took me 10 years, but I made it. So now, you know, this is worse than slavery, actually. The old slavery, old black Joe. I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, my head is hanging low to hear those years. Voices calling, good old Schweitzer Joe. Halva, Nagila, Halva, Nagila, Halva, Nagila, Patekala, Halva, Nagila, Halva, Nagila. Rocks and bagels, baklava. Thank you for your patience. Yes. I enjoyed, enjoyed your talk and uh, found it interesting. You've been doing some thinking on this, obviously. I think about this myself. One of your, the ideas I like, I do like the idea of the use of the Internet. Now, it is true, some people who are not familiar would have to become familiar, but that could be worked out. People are worried about the security of the Internet. That is a problem. But I am confident that the technology can be developed to make it largely secure. You're sending votes to two different locations. Uh, for tallying is, I think, an excellent idea, and uh, would would uh, help in keeping things uh, honest. The other thing is, I think voters should be able to check their vote. 
uh, through some kind of a code number, a uh, code number or a pseudonym or something that they'd be given. They can then later look up on the internet how this uh, pseudonym voted, and if, it, if it's the way they voted, that's fine. If not, they can issue uh, a complaint and thereby check that their vote at least was accurately tallied, and then anybody could go through and tally the whole thing if they want to. Um, I think that uh, um, voting on issues is, is also good. That can go a little too far. They do do the very direct voting in Switzerland and some other places, and we have issues on the ballot here. Um, I have thought that perhaps we should, if it's uh, on a specific type of issue, we should perhaps have voters prove that they have some minimal knowledge of that issue, uh, although that would be difficult to implement. Um, I think the problem is with our political system, uh, the, all the problems we have today, especially the money in politics, far too much money in politics, $3.7 billion on this last election. My God, you know. Uh, we did get rid of the Cialis and tampon commercials for a while, but uh, that's not worth it as far as I'm concerned. Okay, uh, and I have said, probably said it from here, and I've said it in other places, the way to get money out of politics is not to attack the supply as we do. Uh, we're losing that war for the same reason we're losing the war on drugs. We're attacking supply. We should attack demand and substantially <laughs> limit the number of commercials, and other methods of, of uh, uh, you know, tearing down the other candidate or even bringing up their own uh, candidates should go to public forums, either on TV or if it's a local election, uh, at PTA meetings, at, at, uh, and other things like that. Um, term limits, I've been advocating that for a while to the chagrin of some other folks in this room. But uh, I really think, uh, you know, we, even though we get rid of some experience, I think fresh blood uh, is more important both in terms of, of moving things forward and having honesty in government. Um, maybe some kind of uh, switching to multi-party or parliamentary system. Of course, the powers that be uh, will not go along with that. I am a believer in democracy, but primarily at lower levels. Uh, school boards, uh, school councils, small town councils, workers' councils within a given company, uh, and unions, uh, smaller unions, especially stockholders and small corporations and so forth, because people are then close enough to really know what's going on and be able to have an effect. Uh, at some point we're going to come out, I think the biggest problem we have is the inequity in wealth and income. And we're going to come out of this at some point. We came out of the last Gilded Age a bit over 100 years ago. And uh, hopefully we'll come out of this one. Last one, there was some violence in the 1880s with unions and such, but, but not a huge amount. And I, I'm not sure we're going to be that lucky this time. Uh, I'm hoping when my better angels are controlling my thinking that we will, However, when my uh, less good angels are thinking, I'm really hoping for a little blood this time. Thank you. <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> um, I, uh, this is one of the more interesting, provocative speakers that we've had here in a long time. Um, I am sure that a dark fiction writer would have a field day creating a society based on what this gentleman outlined that would make Brave New World look like Sesame Street. <laughs> the truth of the matter is what he is advocating here is not a democracy. Uh, you know, it, it is not an oligarchy. Uh, it is a technocracy where in effect we would be ruled by the machines that we are supposed to be ruling. Uh, the idea that the integrity of the vote would be preserved by computerized voting, uh, when you consider the fact that there are hackers who have gotten into the State Department's computers, there are hackers who have temporarily disabled some of the computers in the Pentagon, even the Vice President of the United States had his personal computer hacked, we have all in this room, I suspect, have at one time or another 
uh, awoke to discover that we had been hacked and much of our files had been uh, destroyed or thrown into disarray, do we want to entrust the vote to this kind of a system? Uh, I think not. There's something to be said about doing things yourself in person if you can. I realize the absentee voting, uh, you know, is sometimes necessary. Uh, but you, 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 you have to have some connection. Your scheme for the government makes government even more complicated than it was in the beginning than it is right now. The, the, the truth of the matter is now if you have a problem that needs solution at the federal level, you go see your congressman. And it can be done. Uh, if, on the other hand, you have a problem under this scheme, you go see your next door neighbor who may or may not know what you're talking about. In effect, it would be it would be a case of the blind leading the blind uh, over a cliff. There's something to be said for having elected officials who have some expertise, or if they don't have expertise in a given subject have people on their staff who know how to reach the people who know something about this. And incidentally, lobbyists was mentioned several times. We all think of lobbyists as cigar smoking, uh, sinister looking guys uh, hanging around outside uh, congressman's office or state representative's office. Fact of the matter is, and I've worked with lobbyists, I've worked with state representatives, and I've hung out with a couple congressmen. I'm a newspaper reporter. You get to see and do a lot, uh, you know, that's part of the job. And I can tell you, uh, you, you learn that there's no one person who knows all things. Lobbyists, the best of them, provide information which can help a legislator at any level uh, decide how he or she wants to vote. The smart lobbyists don't say, hey, Pat, uh, here's this envelope, open it up after you do this. Uh, no, he's going to say, he's going to say, I let you make your own choice in the matter. These are the facts. And the facts are, unfortunately, I have just been told that my time is over. Yeah, I'm L.P. Anderson or Andy Anderson. Uh, one of the reasons that people think I'm dissatisfied with America is that I'm a Vietnam veteran and I took an oath and I pledged to defend the country, the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I'm not dissatisfied with America. I think it's a great country. I'm dissatisfied with the criminals that are running it and the criminals that are masquerading as our elected politicians. The Republican Party is basically packed to the gills with various kinds of moral deviants and criminals masquerading as our elected politicians. The Democratic Party has a lesser percentage and a greater percentage of honest people, but still, huge money is dominating what's happening in America. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, from, the, from this book I quoted earlier, The Economics of Revolution, Thomas Jefferson said, Enlighten the people generally, and tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. He's talking about an informed citizenry. Mm -hmm. Project Censored describes, they teach journalist students every year, journalism students, Project Censor teaches journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if they're going to go into a career in journalism because there are certain things you cannot talk about on radio, television, newspapers in America. This book gives you the top 25 blacked out stories every year. For those of you that might be interested, I gave us a talk here a few months back on the top 10 blacked out subjects of 2014. And I carry these yellow flyers, it has the top ten, and on the back of this, what I call the trillion dollar golden triangle. Americans are maintained in a bubble of ignorance by our media. 
People believe things that aren't real and are just simply mythology. The three of the greatest myths right now, if you puncture any one of these, we would move forward toward a more enlightened society. And th those three myths are number one, that our soldiers are fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands. Number two is the greatest myth ever sold in broad daylight to a modern public, which is a myth of what happened on 9-11. The reality is something totally different. And then number three, of course, is the 30-year myth of the HIV AIDS epidemic. That's recognized now by thousands of doctors all over the world to be the greatest medical industrial fraud in human history. So starting from a, a fact-based fact outlook, start with basic facts and move from there. A short list, 58,000 died in Vietnam on a pack of lies. 300,000 died during the 10 years of the so-called AIDS epidemic in 87 and 97 on a pack of lies. Those things were take, people were taking fatal chemotherapy poison and that's why they died. The HIV has been proven to be harmless by thousands of doctors all over the world. We had an AIDS epidemic but it wasn't caused by HIV. Some people in this room can't even handle the notion of even looking at the evidence published by thousands of doctors, many of them with Nobel Prize credentials. 300,000 to 700,000 die every year in this country for medical malpractice because we have a for-profit system and it's just better to let people die than it is to blow the whistle on doctors that are uh, knowingly or unknowingly killing their patients. 3,000 died on 9-11, and I said the greatest myth ever sold in broad daylight. It was sold to us by the media when the reality is that the World Trade Center complex was a bunch of old buildings that needed to be demolished, and they couldn't figure out how to do it without getting sued for asbestos dust all over lower Manhattan. So they told us it was a terrorist event. And millions of Iraqis, the last thing, we got millions of Iraqis and our soldiers sons and daughters, grandkids dying in Iraq and Afghanistan right now on a total pack of lies. Bring those troops home and start spending the money in America. And it would go a long way towards solving our problems. Thank you. Concerning what has been said about 9-11, I have made all my objections known in the past, and there's no need to reiterate them. <laughs> um, concerning what was said about AIDS, for the most part, that's true. But when I hear thousands of doctors, well, that sounds like what I used to hear on television when you used to hear them say, seven out of ten doctors recommend either aspirin, recommend either anison or bufferin, one or the other. Um, I want to thank you for his very interesting and very well thought out presentation. I didn't agree with all of it, I agree with most of it. But having said that, I have shared the same concerns that others have mentioned concerning balanced security. And when you throw into it that I'm a lifelong Chicagoan, and that we know a thing or two about balanced security problems already in this city, even without the internet, that only serves to um, only serves to enlarge my concerns that much more. And when you throw into it that most of us have bitter memories of what went on in the 2000 election, there I agree with you, Andy. There you are absolutely right. They talked, we heard all about hanging chads and all the rest of this stuff, and we saw the election stolen away from us by the Republican Party. And George W. Bush, who will go down in history, I'm quite confident, as the worst president ever to sit in the president's chair. He made James Buchanan and even Richard Nixon look good. And I never thought I would see the day when anybody made Trenton look good. But then I, then I wasn't exactly ready for, for George W. Bush. Um, um, finally, I meant what I said earlier when I asked about uh, democracy in this town. We have elections that, uh, in which there's no opposition. Now, granted, that's been going on in Chicago for a long time, as most of us know. When the elder Mayor Daly, who were the older people in this room, including myself, remember, when he was, except for the first primary in 1955, and the last one 20 years later, he was not opposed by anybody in the primary, which should come as a surprise to no one, since I have a feeling that 
anyone who did oppose in the primary, well, their garbage might not be picked up, or, <laughs> or they might run into other problems of that sort. And the other thing that I would ask is this. Um, in certain countries, which did not have monarchs, but which had dictatorships of one kind or another, whether of the right or the left, well, they frequently had elections there that were more window dressing than anything else. And so elections, the number of countries with elections, that doesn't necessarily automatically make them democracies. Thank you. Um, you know, um, I hear a lot of people uh, fretting tonight about um, you know whether the American people would be informed enough to uh, make decisions on legislation, and, you know whether you know when, instead of having uh, these elected representatives who supposedly know what the hell they're doing. Well. Um, I don't know how, how many of you actually voted this year. Let's have a raise your hands. Everybody who voted. Twice. Okay. <laughs> oh, 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 Very good. <laughs> all right. All right. Looks like most of the people voted. Good. All right. Well, how many of you noticed? How many of you noticed that on your and, and I assume you're, that most of you here vote in the state of Illinois. So, how many of you noticed on your ballot a set of ballot initiatives? So, Charlie, did you want to say something? Okay, no, no, just chat, chat, no. okay, all right. How many of you noticed how many of you noticed a set of ballot initiatives? Okay, okay, some of you some of you noticed it. Yeah. And and those were about a number of things. There was a there was a so called victims' rights thing. Um, there was um, there was there was something on the minimum wage. Yeah, there was something on the, raising the minimum wage. Various a uh, number of different issues and the people got a chance and which the people got a chance to vote on. Uh, so we already have we already have this kind of direct democracy going on right now. Um, uh, maybe not, not on everything, but, but on those issues, yes. On those issues, and, and, and there's no reason why we couldn't do more of that. In the future, it's already happening. Now, the second thing I would want to say is I, I've, heard a lot of, uh, I, I've heard a lot of blame the American people uh, tonight. And I've I got to say that blaming the American people for what's wrong with America is like blaming a woman for being raped. <laughs> because the, the American, you know, the American people are not the perpetrators of what's wrong with America. We're the victims of it. And, um, and this, is, this is just blaming, blaming the victim. You know, saying people aren't informed, people don't know what's going on. Well, how many people have actually got a course in civics when they were kids? Most, yeah, most people did not. Okay, I see some hands going up. Oh, but, yeah, most yeah, yeah. but most people did not. And, and even if they did, it probably wasn't all that good. And, and now, and I hear, I heard, I think, Tim call, say that Americans are lazy. Well, we, we work harder and we put in more hours than people in Japan or Western Europe or Canada or Australia or any of the other rich countries. Um, we work longer hours. This is a fact. So how can you say we're lazy? The, the reality is that most Americans are working so hard uh, trying to support themselves and their families, that they don't have time to really get involved in politics. Now, uh, and then this generalization about Americans being selfish. I, I don't buy that at all. I think, now I realize that probably most of the regulars at the College of Complexes are single men who, who, have, um, who, who have never been married and, and have no kids. But that's not true for most Americans. Most Americans have families. And they care very much about their families and are willing to sacrifice a lot for them. You know, most people, most people really do care about other people, the people they know. Uh, to, so to say that people are selfish, that's just not true. It's a generalized, it's a very negative generalization. Um, if you want to blame somebody for what's wrong with America, blame the ruling class. You know, blame the people that got the bailout in 2008. You know, and by the way, if you say that our democracy is working then how the fuck do you explain that fucking bailout? Because um, what they did was they, those guys are a bunch of goddamn crooks, and they, they, and they bailed them out. The govern, our, gov, our, what supposedly is our government bailed them out with no strings attached. And, and that ought to tell you who really runs this country. Um, you know, 
Uh, Lee Ping, you, you question what is the real purpose of government. I'll tell you. The purpose of government is to protect the interests of the ruling class. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it for the ruling class. Hooray. Kill the rich. Eat the rich. Eat the rich. Oh, no, uh, Lee, thanks for your talk, even though I wasn't here. I'm sure it was good. Democracy in China is not democracy in America. When there's an election in China or Russia, 97% of the people vote for whoever's on it, because there's only one person on the ballot. So an election is nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was an election judge. But I'm a librarian, so I read a lot. I read things. So I read that if there weren't elections and people giving money and blah, 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 there would be people shooting in the streets. So do you want people shooting each other or do you want an election? That's what it comes down to. Sorry. So all this money, it, you can get a gun and shoot your political enemy, or you can vote for your enemy, or you can give money to your enemy. But uh, anyways, of course, that doesn't make voting good, but it makes it realistic. Um, slavery. Slavery was in America 151 years ago. It was, uh, it changed. So that was a, a democratic thing. There were probably people on the corners uh, demonstrating against it, small groups here and there, and democracy worked. Um, and again, again, democracy Democracy is um, something useful, I think. Okay. All right. All right, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. If there's nobody else, let's let Lee Ping up. Uh, oh, Charlie, okay. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for putting me out of your PowerPoint. I'll be eclectic as usual. Um, he wants this pluralistic pluralism. Uh, the founding fathers, and even Ben Franklin said, he, he referenced it there, he wants government by the mob. Uh, Franklin said, the masses have many heads but no brains. <laughs> uh, Another little thing there, he said that he needed the internet for something, for dissatisfaction, or somehow or other, the internet created dissatisfaction, I think it was. I've been reading about the French Revolution, and they didn't have the internet in 1789, and I don't know how they got dissatisfied without it. <laughs> it started kill, killing all the, the bourgeoisie. <laughs> But they seem to do so. Um, is the government working or not? Yes, it's working. Look outside. The infrastructure is going. It's, it's proceeding. The basic framework of our society is operating. Uh, there's no devolves about that. And I agree entirely with my friend. This doesn't happen too often, Pat Butler. Uh, I've been doing lobbying for 25, 35 years mostly at the federal level, now at the state and city level. Uh, you need professionals in office, knowledgeable people, people who accrue experience. I don't like term limits. Uh, you need staff people who can research the issues. And it's a pleasure to go to a legislative body and discuss the matter with individuals you don't have to really inform because they know more than you do. And that's very often the case. I've been in the things on transportation where the chairman of the Committee on Transportation gave a speech on railroads entirely without notes 
very informative, gave the details and things like that. That's the people you want operating a system like that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. You want sound, knowledgeable people establishing public policy. Our society is getting more complex. This is not some, some kind of agrarian, kind of Jeffersonian <laughs> county in the world. Now, one other specific example I'll give you was this very week. Uh, there was hearings, public hearings, to establish. The, the other thing I would say, if you don't want to do this, join an association. I'm a member of more associations than I, I, I know of. <laughs> I don't even know how many there are at this point in time. But if I find ever get involved in a political party, if it's a Democrat, Republican, Green Party, or Libertarians even, if they represent your interests, please get involved in that. Or join an association. This is the vehicle we use in our system to articulate our views. I don't have enough time for all these other legislative issues, so I rely, say, on human rights or something, or civil liberties. There are organizations who would do adequate work and have very knowledgeable, responsible people keeping up on the issues and the legislation. I'm glad to pass over to them for a few dollars every year or something like that. But to give you an example, if you want to turn it over to the citizens, and this happens every year, we get the CTA budget, and in our little group, our association, it's 200 pages, the budget. We get advanced copies. I insist that everybody who testifies read it. And we go through it and we reference pages. Now other citizens get up there and they go, well, my boss was late, and I don't like, you know, they talk about CT, and they're genuine issues, but they don't know anything, generally, about how a transit system operates, and they know nothing about the fi financial things under discussion. And you want, to turn, you want to turn our transportation system over to those people to make policy decisions? It's just, no, I, I sit through these hearings, and there's good ideas, there's things that come out of that I enjoy listening. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, it, it's all decided on that. But anyhow, I think that's about it. Uh, anyhow, thank you very much. And we'll see you on Thursday at the protest. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Lee Ping, you get the last word. Yes, Lee Ping. <sighs> Where's that guy that wants to kill the rich? <laughs> Let's go kill some rich people. Thank you for all the comments, and uh, they are generally good. And uh, I'm uh, uh, expecting uh, most of them. Uh, Tim mentioned that the problem is not only in politics, political system, but uh, also cultural. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's true. And after uh, Jim Hawker mentioned uh, in the Nordic country, they they have a pretty good system. And uh, that reminds me uh, a recent article I read. Uh, it plots uh, the GDP for uh, versus the, the uh, latitude of the country. Okay, so if the country is uh, with close to the equator, within plus or minus 20 degrees, and uh, all the countries are poor countries, and the, the country is uh, above 20 degree, and uh, they have a much, much higher GDP. It's, uh, it's uh, the shape, it's just, the trend is just, uh, it's, very distinctive. Uh, the only two, three, three spots which are against the trend is uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And uh, I think uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, foreign uh, immigrants. So they, they, they are against, uh, they are the only three high income countries in, in the, in the, around the equator area. So I think those are cultural related, environmentally related, and uh, it's not really the political system uh, can solve all the problems. 
Uh, there are lots of uh, things about the uh, internet security. That's good because uh, it is a problem we want to uh, uh, conquer. Uh, but uh, I think it's getting better and better. Uh, like more and more people using internet to do banking, to purchase items, and uh, the internet purchasing is uh, increased uh, dramatically. So those are related to your money. It's uh, your real money. Uh, people are, at least they have certain amount of confidence on that. Uh, voting, maybe the next time, but, uh, and also internet voting, I don't mean it's uh, the only option. I think it's uh, the convenient option. If uh, people strongly concerned about that, we can keep several systems in parallel, maybe possible. Uh, lobbies, yeah, I think uh, as the uh, gentleman said here in the charts, lobbyists, I think they are very knowledgeable. I, I have no question about that. They are either coming from the industry or they are from the legislative uh, members previously. So they know all the, the rules and know, know the industry, but they are in certain way they biased. They have their purpose, no matter it's a corporate okay. purpose or some other interest like a, a environmental lobbyist, they, they have a, a, their interest. So uh, I think in this country, this, a good thing is that the lobbyists, they have rules, they follow certain laws uh, to do their lobby. <clears throat> in many countries, all the lobbies are under table, uh, going under table. So it's a it's a really problem. Here it's uh, not too bad, but I still think uh, that's how the money gets into the politics uh, in a big way. Uh, about the people, like. Uh, uh, some people are concerned about the general public, they just don't have the knowledge. That's true. Uh, I think the, for the expertise, they should reside in the interest group, or in the government, or in the academic area, or in the media, uh, like a newspaper or uh, those media areas. They, they should have the expertise. A general public, don't need to have that. And uh, I certainly don't expect the general public will read uh, 2,000 pages of uh, Obamacare. And uh, I think uh, we make our judgment. If uh, I feel uh, I want the government do this way or that way, or I feel some delegate can have my vote and I'll trust him or her or the group. So it's a, uh, definitely there's an expertise in the world which uh, cannot be placed on everybody's mind. Uh, there are some uh, good things about the government. Uh, Char Charlie uh, mentioned that in the government there are people very knowledgeable. I think those are good, the, the expertise should be there. And uh, for the general public, they just need to be informed. And uh, they, there are complaints, uh, concerns, or dissatisfaction, voice that. Let us uh, have a way to voice that and uh, uh, in a timely bad manner. Not every four years, and then the voice got lost. OK, uh, thank you very much. All right, very good. Kill the rich. You can tell them. Kill them. Kill them. Round them up. I'm with you, man. I didn't say that. You're putting words in my mouth. Well, whatever. Get them.